and welcome back to Wikish Theories. In today's video, we like to talk about Le Seraphim, focusing on a little breakdown and analysis of the clues that we have so far to see what they can tell us about the concept of their debut. Now, Le Seraphim is an upcoming girl group that will debut on May the 2nd under source music and hype. The name of the group is an anagram of the phrase I'm fearless, and fittingly enough, both their debut album and title track are going to be called Fearless as well. Their name, however, is also very similar to the spelling of the word Seraphim, which in turn are angelic creatures that can be found in the three monotheistic religions. On a very general level, the Seraphim are considered high-ranking angels who have six wings and are associated to fire. Since their name comes from a word that means to burn, the Seraphim are quite literally the burning ones, that is, those angels who are ignited by divine love and shine bright as they radiate this powerful light. Now, to be fair, up to this point it's unconfirmed whether Le Seraphim is a name inspired by these types of angels, but as we'll see in a second, these entities might fit quite well with other sources that might have inspired their debut. Before we get to that, however, let's start from what we know for sure that is none other than their main theme. Now, if there's one thing that we know about this group is that they're going to be fearless, which is a quality that not only will define their debut concept, but also their group identity going forward. Le Seraphim are fearless and nobody can stop them from achieving their goals, and this general message is already evident in both the group and individual films. If we take a look at the members' teasers, for instance, we can see that their fearlessness takes on different shapes in different forms. They are bold, they are confident, they are not afraid of changing their image, they can slay any concept, and they are talented and versatile in many areas. This is a concept that is even more fleshed out in the trailer, because in The World Is My Oyster, the members literally fall from the heavens as they let the world know who they are dealing with. Since the trailer is also the intro of the album, the whole idea that the world is their oyster will be front and center in their concept moving forward, because it really gives you the idea that they are now in the position to take everything that life has to offer. In the trailer, moreover, we also discovered that the ghosts themselves are ready to take up on this opportunity, because in the narration, Sakura lets us know that they want to have the world on the palm of their hands. This statement implies that in the concept, the members are not only fearless, but also confident in their abilities and ambitious enough to get to their final goal, and if we take a look at the concept photos, this idea is reinforced by Volume 1 as well. In Black Petrol, for instance, Le Seraphim played the role of Formula 1 drivers getting ready for their race in the circuit. This is a concept that suggests speed, ambition, competitiveness and skill, but it also sets the scene for the metaphorical race that the members will have to begin on their debut. If we compare the music industry to Formula 1, for instance, Le Seraphim are the latest talents to join the race, right? And in Volume 1, we really get the sense that they are ready to prove themselves in their field. When it comes to Volume 2 Blue Cyper, on the other hand, we see that the concept is a lot different, because if Volume 1 is bold, stylish and modern, Volume 2 is more classical and sophisticated. As I mentioned earlier, this is a great example of how versatile this group will be when it comes to different concepts, but as it turns out, Volume 2 might be important for the debut concept as well. In the pictures, we see the members in an elegant room filled with water and flowers, and both at the top and at the bottom of the photos, we can see sentences that are actually very important to understand what's going on. On the top section, for instance, the girls explain that they are living their life, that they intend to keep everything that they want, and that they will not be turned into sea foam. As they make the point that they should not be messed with, and that they won't give in to the other's request, the narration clarifies that this will not be a love story, because they don't need a twisted love. On the bottom section, on the other hand, the girls deny the possibility to disappear or give up on their voices, and instead they encourage to turn the ocean over to them, as they smother the world with their sea. As their dream keeps on growing, the narration ends by explaining that only if you never give up, this dream will come true, and as we'll see in a second, this is a key detail to keep in mind. You see, if we consider the setting of the photos and the narration, it actually seems that the concept of their debut might actually be inspired by The Little Mermaid, not so much by the Disney animation, but rather by the original fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen. Now, if we compare the two stories, at first glance, the general plot seems pretty much the same. You have a little mermaid interest 
interested in the human world that falls in love with a prince, and in order to become human herself, she makes a pact with a sea witch where she exchanges her voice for a pair of legs. So far so good, right? But once we dive a bit deeper, so to speak, there are certain key differences that actually connect us to Volume 2. In the original story, for instance, the Kingdom of the Sea Folk has a total of six princesses who live together in their palace and spend their days tending to their flower gardens. Right off the bat, this is coherent with the number of members, the elegant settings of the photos, as well as the presence of the flowers all around. Much like in Le Seraphim's captions, moreover, Anderson's Little Mermaid is not really a love story, because her crush for the prince is only one of the reasons why she wants to become human. You see, in Anderson's lore, the sea folk are creatures without a human soul, and because of that they are unable to get into heaven. Even if they can live for up to 300 years, once they die they turn into sea foam, so there is no eternity waiting for them after death. In the story, the Little Mermaid wants to become human for the prince, sure, but first and foremost, to have a human soul that can make her go to heaven. In the lore, mermaids can only access paradise by marrying a human who loves them, so much like Le Seraphims, the little mermaid is not a love story, but rather a quest for eternity disguised as a romance. Like in the animation, the little mermaid decides to go to the sea witch to become human, but in the original her price is much worse. In the movie, Ariel had to give up her voice, and if she didn't get the prince in three days, she would transform back into a mermaid and be Ursula's prisoner forever. In the original, however, she not only gives up her voice, but every step that she takes with her human legs would feel like getting stabbed by sharp blades. On top of that, in case she failed, she would not go back to being a mermaid, but she would turn into seafoam and die. The terrible price of the little mermaid is giving up on her greatest gift, suffering throughout her entire human life life and then dissolve into nothing in case of failure. This is why in the captions Le Seraphim mentioned the sea foam giving up on their voices as well as the risk of disappearing into nothingness. These are the exact same dangers that the little mermaid has to face in her quest for eternity, but when it comes to Le Seraphim there is a huge difference, in the sense that in contrast they have no intention whatsoever to suffer through those things. If we compare the story to the captions, we can notice that the confidence, boldness and fearlessness of Le Seraphim is giving the mermaid concept a bit of a twist. Instead of accepting their suffering and sacrificing for a twisted love, the members refuse to give up on their voices and are confident they won't be turned into seafoam and disappear. Even if they are that sad to reach their dream, this dream is something that they will achieve their way and without any compromise, to the point that they even announce that they will smother the world with their sea. After all, the world is their oyster, and if their fearlessness is indeed what defines them, then maybe instead of being like the little mermaid, they'll be like the great mermaid that the truck for shadows. If we take an even closer look to the songs, however, it seems that their journey will be a difficult one, because the album actually ends with a song called Sour Grapes. Now this is an interesting choice, because Sour Grapes is a phrase that refers to a state of anger in relation to something that one wants but cannot achieve. This might be an indication that if as an album Fearless will introduce us to the girls being bold and confident in themselves, the final track might introduce a conflict in their journey to achieve their goals. One track that we still haven't discussed, however, is actually Blue Flame, which in turn might actually connect us right back to the possible storyline. You see, back when Hybe announced the Hybe original stories, they introduced the three related to BTS, Tomorrow by Together and an iPhone, but also a fourth one called Crimson Heart connected to a girl group. Up until now, we don't know if the group in question will be Le Seraphim, but the story was actually about six girls who find a book and a red necklace and go on an adventure in search for the island of the blue fireflies. The blue flame that the song is talking about may be none other than the light that calls them towards the island, but if this flame is something that ignites instead of the girls themselves, then maybe we can even connect it right back to the burning symbolism of the Seraphim Angels. On top of that, the premise of Crimson Heart has even little similarities with the Little Mermaid, because before leaving for their quest, the girls lived all their lives in the city of Refugia, which is a place completely cut off from the rest of the world. In the same way, the Little Mermaid Mermaid leaves the secluded kingdom under the sea in order to go on her quest in the human world, so the coming of age aspect of the concept are certainly all there. To see how things will play out, however, we'll have to wait and see. In the meantime, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, please think about liking and subscribing. As always, thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye bye!